As you open the doors, you see a long, dark hallway stretching before you. You see the walls, stone, are glistening with mildew and moisture. The air is filled with a musty odor. The hallway seems empty to you. Uh, okay, wait, hold on. What is your passive perception? All right, with disadvantage, because I don't have dark vision, I would have a six. <laughs> six? Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, the hallway seems empty. Oh, okay, well, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna light a torch, and now what do I see? Yeah, okay, that's fair. Do you want to be a better dungeon master? Me too. Hi, my name is William Tramp, also known as This FNGM, GM, and today I'd like to talk to you about passive scores in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, or whatever game you play that has a similar mechanic. Specifically, I want to focus in on what they are, what problems have I had with them at my table, and what solution have I come up with that maybe even you can use at yours. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, first things first, let's define what we're talking about here. A passive score is a mechanic in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, stereotypically attached to perception. A passive perception score allows the players to see an enemy or some sort of hidden detail without actually having to make a roll. The idea here is that a player has a static number of their passive score for their perception. The dungeon master compares that score to the NPC's stealth skill or maybe to the perception DC of a trap and then decides whether or not the player is able to perceive it. Again, all without having to make a roll. Now, personally, I love the passive perception mechanic. Ever since they introduced it in Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition and then carried it over to 5, I've been a huge fan of the idea because as a DM, as long as I am well prepared, this is a great tool to have at my disposal. The problem is, is the text is kind of murky as to when it should and should not apply. and. Also, I personally believe that the rules as written don't go far enough. I should probably explain that, so let's discuss that. The first problem I have with passive scores in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition is exemplified in the player's handbook. Now, if I start on page 175, where the rules are discussing passive checks, there are two distinct references that are made to other portions of the book to show you how they are intended to be used. The first area is on the next page, well, okay, page 177, where the rules discuss how to use a dexterity stealth check to hide and how a dungeon master is supposed to resolve that situation. Pretty simply, the player would make a stealth check and then the DM would compare the result of that stealth check to a NPC's um, passive perception score. Okay, that's fair enough. I'll head over now to page 182, the second reference, where the book starts to explain how noticing threats while adventuring is played out at the table. You would compare the stealth check or the DC of the threat to the character's passive perception score, and then this would determine if the players were able to see it or not. Again, this makes sense to me. But both of these examples are really the same example. It's just someone's hiding, the other one's trying to notice, and all they did with these two different sections were just flip who's on which side. Okay. That's not the problem, though. The problem comes in the observant feat. The observant feat get, grants you a couple of abilities, but the very last ability specifically states you have a plus five bonus to your passive wisdom perception and passive intelligence investigation scores. So the book has given us two examples, um, specific examples, as to how passive perception is supposed to work. But we get zero examples of how passive investigation is supposed to work. Now, I know that very likely what happened here is the game's designers the, were trying to say, hey, here's an example of how a passive score can work, and the dungeon master can make the decision as to how it will be used at the table. But as time has gone on, we have realized that this sort of loosey-goosey approach to showing us rules as intended has sort of created kind of an issue. 
an issue so large that an entire new book was created to address a lot of these vague rules questions. Oh, I'm sorry, it's filled with wonderful new information. Certainly it's not just a rata that we paid for. This problem extends to the Dungeon Master's Guide, which has no obvious reference to passive scores within the book. The Dungeons and Dragons character sheet specifically has a spot for passive perception, but not for any other skill. This tells me that the designers really only planned on perception being an actual passive score, but not the other skills, even though they mention by name passive investigation. So another theory I had about this is that the designers weren't intending for other skills to have passive scores, just perception. And because so many DMs seem to struggle between whether they should use investigation or perception, they decided to create a preemptive defense and state that the observant feat would apply to both, depending on which way your dungeon master seems to go. Okay, regardless of the reasoning for this, I still think this creates a problem. And it becomes even more problematic when I start to think about the intention of putting that score in there in the first place. Why would the designers put a passive perception score into the game? My belief is because of the idea of active processes versus passive processes. An active process at least in my definition, is something that we do as human beings that we intend to do. So for instance, if I'm looking for my keys and I start opening drawers and I start looking under the couch and I start demanding that my daughter bring them back because that's my car, dang it, then I'm using an active process. I am taking intentional steps to find whatever it is I'm looking for. On the other hand, we have passive processes. Passive processes are the types of processes that we don't intend to do. I don't think about breathing, I just do it. If a spider crawls across the table, ah! if a spider crawls across the table and I notice it, I don't think I was actively looking for a spider, but I happened to notice it and my attention was drawn to it because of a passive process that my brain has created. So what I believe the game designers were trying to do was they were trying to recreate the difference between active and passive processes in the game by creating the passive perception score. The thing is, and this is my second problem with passive scores, the thing is, is that just noticing something in your field of view or in your hearing or smelling something, these aren't the only passive processes that happen to people, and they aren't the only passive processes that happen in the game. So what do we as Dungeon Masters do? Well, I'm gonna share with you what I've done at my table, as well as provide you the resources to run your passive scores the exact same way if you choose to. So strap in, motherfucker. To solve this problem for myself, I took a look at the list of the 5th edition skills as presented in the player's handbook and started to divide the skills into one of two categories, active and passive. In the passive pile, I found perception fit in quite nicely. I mean, the book explains it, so no argument from me there. I also decided to expand what perception may mean in this case. So for instance, it's not just about finding hidden threats, but it's also about finding hidden details. So sometimes, you know, you'll read through an adventure and you'll notice that, you know, with a passive perception score of such and such or higher, or with a perception check of such and such or higher, they'll notice blood on the floor. Well, I think that you might be able to notice that without having to make an active check. So I'm going to toss that onto the pile of a potential for a passive check. I also realize that insight is absolutely a contender for a passive score, 100%. One of the things I find in my games is that, you know, I'll have NPCs lie to my players, and then I start to think to myself, why aren't they asking for insight checks? They should be. They'll never know these people are lying. While the player may not be nearly as insightful as their character, I am still forcing them to be as insightful as their character and only letting them know when an NPC is lying when the player calls for the check. Okay, so that could be a contender for passive, I would say. The knowledge skills, arcana, history, nature, 
religion. All of these include passive processes within their scope. Now, I want to be super clear about this. When I'm dividing these skills out to active or passive, I am not saying that there are not active ways to use the passive skills. And I certainly am not saying that we should replace active skill checks with passive scores. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there are certain cases, certain uses of each of these skills that could be considered a passive process. And if we do a little bit of prep work as dungeon masters, then maybe we can reduce some of the time at the table that we spend watching the players ask for checks or asking for checks ourselves that may not be necessary. Anyway, so I made these two lists. I've got my active, I got my passive. So then I started to think, okay, well, what uses of these skills would be considered passive versus active? Knowledge skills are interesting because the knowledge skills cover a very large scope. Sometimes the knowledge skills are used to do something within that realm. For instance, if you want to make a magic item, your dungeon master might call for like an arcana check to represent how well you're able to craft this wondrous item of power. But there's also a lot of passive checks that is involved with knowledge skills. When I see something in my field of view, I don't have to stop on every single item or person or place or whatever's in my field of view. I don't have to stop and think, wait, what do I know about that? That's a street. If I walk in the street, I could get hit by a car. I don't think about the fact that I could be hit by a car. I just know that this is a possibility. I've trained my brain enough to make this a passive process. And I think the same thing can happen for lore in Dungeons and Dragons as it pertains to the knowledge skills. So what I've done in my games is I've taken certain types of checks in which I would ask for one of these knowledge skills to be rolled, specifically the lore items. And I am started to work towards making these a passive score process. An example of this is whenever I put a monster in front of the players as part of some sort of encounter, I have a little list of things the players might be able to know about this monster if they give a knowledge check. Now, usually for years, that would be an active process. I'd sit with, here with my little list and wait for the players to roll. Ha ha ha. And if they don't, it's their own fault for not thinking about it. Okay, but again, the characters may be smarter than they are, may, may think about these things a lot more. So in certain cases, I will take a look at my player's passive knowledge score. I will take a look at my little list of lore for the monster or the item or the place, and I will include in my explanation of what they encounter the information they would already know. You're coming along the road and you see a lone goblin with its sword drawn, it snarls at you. While you see this goblin, you, wizard, know that goblins tend to fight in groups with one another, so there may be more nearby. I'm just going to slide it into the explanation. You know, rather than waiting for the players to make the roll, because that breaks the immersion and that adds more time to the table. Whereas I could just add that into my prep work and make it a little bit smoother. I do this now with NPCs for insight. I'll kind of write down, uh, you know, little indicators of what are the things the, the NPCs will most often try to hide from the players or conceal or obfuscate uh, from the players. I probably mispronounced that word. I'm going to stick with it. Obfuscate. And then whenever one of these items pops up in a conversation with the NPC, I'll immediately let one of the players, whoever has the highest passive insight, as long as they've beaten the NPC's deception role, then I would just immediately look over at the player and say, you get the idea that they may be not 
so forthcoming. Their voice shakes when they mention that they don't know who the king of the land is. I also do this with traps or other hidden details in rooms when it comes to passive perception. So for instance, if there's a trap in the room, I will, before I sit down the table, I'll compare the player's passive perceptions with the, uh, the perception check DC to notice the trap, and then I'll toss in a little hint. Now I don't say, there's a trap there. I say, you notice that there's a pool of blood um, about three feet down the hallway, or there's a little groove that you see in the wall. I let the players hear the explanation and then they can decide if whatever else is going on is worth investigating. Now, how does this apply to you at home? I have released a new product on Drive Through RPG. It's pay what you want. I mean, you just listened to this explanation, so you can already implement it, but I figured I'd take this a step further and make it even easier to implement at your table. I put the link down below in the thing, and in there is not only an explanation of my expanded passive scores and you know, how to calculate them and such. But I've also included this handy table that you can print off and use at your table. This table that you can use at your table, we're gonna go ahead and just call this a worksheet. I've created a handy worksheet that you can use at your table. So you simply print this off and then you fill it out with your player's passive scores. I'll do it right here in front of you so you, you know what I'm talking about. So I have my worksheet here. I have a row for uh, to put the player characters' names in, and then I have a row for each passive score that they could have. And I've included at the bottom here the calculation for the passive score, as well as just a reminder that advantage gives a plus five to the passive score and disadvantage gives a minus five to the passive score. So let's fill this out for, I'll use the basements and besties, my actual play group, um, as an example here. So based on the scores that I know them to have, I would say here Adelaide has a plus four to the arcana skill, so the passive scores could be 10 plus that. So we'll go ahead and do a 14. I know that Brock has a plus three, so I would go with a 13 here. Colton is not trained, but he does have a bump to intelligence, so that would be an 11. Deirdre, also not trained, and uh, but a decent intelligence, she has a 12. And RJ has a dump stat intelligence and no training in Arcana, so we have a 9. So I'll do the same thing for history, I'll do the same thing for insight, nature, perception, and religion. So here we go. And that's it. It's that easy. Anyway, I hope you found some use out of this video and my explanation for how I expand passive scores for my Dungeons & Dragons game. And if you think it's useful, I hope you go and you grab that uh, th that uh, expanded uh, passive rules that I put out there on Drive-Thru RPG, and I really hope you find some use out of it. If you do download it and end up using it at your table, do me a favor and let me know what you thought of it, especially in the reviews on Drive-Thru, because, you know, Getting higher star reviews and comments kind of tends to get the information out there to more people. Really boost that algorithm. Also, if you didn't like it, let me know what's wrong. Let me know what I didn't do right in my explanation, what could have been further expanded on. You know, and I will be happy to make sure that I make adjustments as time goes on. That's it. That's all I have to say for today. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you want and hit that like button if you want to help me out. And also I have a Patreon or something. I don't know. Either way, thanks for being here and I'll catch you all next time.